Welcome to Pi Talks. Today we're going to be talking about an especially important topic, pediatric ophthalmology, which tends to get neglected a bit in the commercial sphere, but it's really important, obviously, for the future of our children. We welcome to the program Dr. Dina Zur and Dr. Matthias Iglicki. <laughs> You know, it's always fantastic to see you two, uh, your up and coming KOLs around the planet, both in Israel and Argentina. And we're live here in Vietnam, so let's get right into it. I'd like to first discuss with you both inherited retinal diseases. So in your practice, what are some of the more common inherited retinal diseases or IRDs that you encounter? The most common one is definitely retinitis pigmentosa, which itself includes a broad spectrum of clinical conditions and it can have an onset at different ages. If we talk about pediatric cases and labor congenital amaurosis LCA, which is a very rare genetic eye disorder, this even affects infants who are born blind. Stargardt disease is the most common maculopathy we see among inherited retinal diseases and the onset is in the early teens or in their 20s. Can you describe some of the signs and symptoms of these IRDs? Sure, so retinitis pigmentosa is characterized by onset of nyctalopia, which is difficult to seeing at night. Patients then describe loss of their peripheral visual fields and later on also disturbance of the central visual field. When it gets in a darker environment, they are often called clumsy because they bump into things or they're called impolite because they don't see people that are around them. And infants, the symptoms are quite different and it's much more challenging to diagnose these cases. They can include uh, strabismus, nystagmus, uh, photophobia and uh, ocular digital signs which is when the babies uh, poke or press or rub their eyes in order to evoke some visual potentials. Dr. Glicky, do you have any more comments on how difficult these cases are to diagnose? When we face an inheritance disease, and a, in this case a child, there is a huge gap between treating adult and treating a child. In order to see and to check up these patients, we have to get a big team in order to get this patient under anesthesia for any kind of diagnosis. And even more, the diagnosis um, is done by different kind of ancillary tests that are very difficult to achieve. So that is why we need a very complex setting. Not everyone can do this. Now, could you kind of comprehensively let me know the different methods used to diagnose IRDs? So the diagnosis is based, as Matthias just explained, on anamnesis, clinical findings, imaging findings, electrophysiology testing, and finally genetics. So is genetic testing widely available? Is it cost prohibitive? Tell me a little bit more. The costs for uh, panels, genetic panels for inherited retinal diseases, they have dropped uh, immensely. These are much more accessible now than they have been in the past. In the near future, so we will be treating our patients before disease appears. That is to say, we are going to screen our patient from the genetic point of view very early in life. And then we can uh, fix those genes that are modificated and then try to not express that disease. That is to say, for instance, magna myopic and that ended up in retinal detachment. So genetic testing nowadays is the present, but genetic treatment will be the future for sure. Well, I'm very curious how gene therapy overall helps these patients, but in your answer, I'm wondering if you could also speak to not only the advantages but potentially some disadvantages as well. The main advantage is, of course, that we can treat the disease uh, with a causative therapy, as Matthias said, that it's really tailored to repair the functional defect that causes the disease. But this is also one of the dis disadvantages because it's gene dependent. So RP65 is very, very real, and the majority of RP patients cannot be helped with this treatment. And also the high costs of the development of the R&D and of the treatment itself is also one of the disadvantages of this approach. The idea is to have these gene therapies early in life, not only inside the eye, but also in any kind of disease that we might know today. Now, moving on, I'd like to discuss pediatric trauma cases, which I know you both are expert in as well. 
What are some of the more common injuries associated with pediatric trauma? If you say someone needs to go to the surgery, is due to trauma. And those are domestic trauma, such as uh, any kind of an attendee child that is inside home or inside the kindergarten. In this case, she or he has an, a trauma in, into the eye. And of course, shortly after the open globe and a retinal detachment. Secondly, we'll say car accidents. And the main thing that we see is uh, for sure retinal detachment due to trauma. Now, Dr. Aglicki, you mentioned car accidents uh, as being a possibility that causes these problems to happen. Are there other things mm -hmm. that you might note uh, sports injuries? Do parents need to be concerned about that? And in addition to that, how do you prevent these types of injuries in children? Till six, seven years old, those are domestic accidents and not a lot of uh, sport. But and when they pass to kindergarten to primary school, sports is very important. And they are not taking precautions where they are riding a bike, not wearing a helmet, and this is a big concern. Secondly, when they are playing as well, Little children playing tennis, the ball inside the eye, it's uh, one of the uh, major concerns. And last but not least, when they are doing sports, working out without the proper protection in golf. And you know, the ball, the smallest the ball is, the more impact and the more damage the eye will be. So golf is one of the main causes that is devastating. Tennis can give us a little bit uh, more space to work. Uh, when they are a little bit older, when they are doing professional boxing, this is the number one uh, the two trauma. Now, when those co kids come in, I would imagine they don't always necessarily have a, an expert pediatric surgeon at their disposal. So what are some of the tips you could provide on managing pediatric trauma cases overall? The first thing everyone should do is try to engage with the family and also with the children in order to check her or his visual acuity. The best visual acuity at the beginning might guide us as a maybe general physician or so general ophthalmologist to realize how important was the impact of the trauma or the situation. Secondly, is ask to the patient if he or she sees in the visual field any black spot. If he or she does, that means he or she might get retina detachment or a retinal tear. That need to be transferred straight to the retina surgeon because that eye needs to be checked up properly with Fondox examination and even more under general anesthesia in order to do some scleral indentation in order to check the periphery of the eye. By the way, how is treating pediatric trauma different from treating such trauma in adults? We need to have an interdisciplinary team. There is some kind of anesthesiologist who are very keen on performing this kind of anesthesia in pediatric, which is not the same as adult. Secondly, you we have to get different devices and different cut rate and aspiration rates in our vitrectomy settings for this child. We need to have a different kind of 23, 25, 27 gauge in order to go into the eye. The conception itself, the eye which is that is growing, is an eye that has a thick vitreous. So you need to have the tools in order to take that vitreous out. It's a small eye. So again, you need to get um, any kind of forceps scissors in order to go into that small eye and not to damage that eye. As Dina said, if uh, we are treating a patient that is maybe has a retinal detachment, not due to trauma, but due to an, an inherited disease, that inherited disease can be combined with heart disease, kidney disease, and any kind of uh, failure disease in the body. So that is why we need to get very well-trained anesthesiologists. I would like to add just something with the post-operative uh, follow-up, which is very different from adults. First of all, you need to take care that they don't develop amblyopia in the, in the damaged eyes. So usually we cooperate with the pediatric ophthalmologist and they have a important role there and also the children used to uh, produce more inflammatory reactions after the surgery so the whole follow-up needs to be more close the family needs to be involved and also we need to take care of the fellow eye 
and explain to the child and the family that they need protective eyeglasses. There won't be any unfortunate uh, incidents with the good eye. We've discussed a lot about trauma so far in children, but are there other instances where retina surgery in children is required? Could you describe some of those instances and how they differ from such surgery in adults? I want to combine the two topics. We were talking about Stickler syndrome as a good example because they have uh, high myopia. They uh, used to detach at a very early age and sometimes we even perform uh, preventive surgery uh, when we see large retinal tears with scleral buckling in order to prevent retinal detachment because we know that the, the chances for the retina to de detach in these cases are, are high. Can you tell me, do outcomes differ between children and adults? First cases we performed, we see little child, they recover much faster than adults. Even more when uh, you see any kind of complications such as retina vitreous hemorrhage. In adults, it might take one or two months in order to wash out. But in little children, uh, that vitreous hemorrhage can go away in one or two days. And even more, if you do a kind of coroscopy the following day, the sclerotomics where you enter inside the eye, those are absolutely closed two or three days after the surgery. In uh, adults, you have to wait until three months in order to see a full closure of that. So in a way, we are having a challenging case, but the results we are expecting, it's much nicer and uh, faster than in adults. Tell me also about post-operative care and follow-up in children. That's uh, very uh, important and you have to be prepared. Otherwise, it will be a burden of patients with a burden of uh, checkups with a lot of difficult interventions. That is to say that if there is a small child one, two, three, until six years old, you have to use for every single checkup, general anesthesia, at least the first of two uh, follow-up appointments in order to check how the anatomy. Then when you see the anatomy is very well and the retina is applied, reattached, you can follow them up by visual testing. That is to say to grab red color that pay attention, the, the children should pay attention of that. It can be a red color, things such as we have a drops with a red uh, lid. So uh, that is an um, indirect sign that the patient is doing well. Dr. Zur, are there certain retinal procedures that you would not perform on children? Talking about uh, retinal testing, I think all of those uh, can be done in children. It depends mainly on the cooperation of the child and the, the, the age of the child on the neurological uh, status. We have the, the proper um, staff that is trained to work with small children. In these children, the treatment is pretty customized. If you have uh, devices to treat adults, there is no way that you can do that with children. So you have to set up a pediatric clinic in order to see this patient that deserve proper treatment and they need different kind of devices at Dinashas. Are there certain surgeries that tend to occur more frequently than others in children? Well, number one, as I said, is trauma and retinal detachment due to trauma. Secondly, as is high myopic. A patient that maybe develop a retinal detachment in one eye and now we have to prevent the fellow eye with a scleral buckling. Last but not least, some complication of inheritance diseases, traumas or diseases, such inheritable diseases, condition that might lead as a complication as a retinal detachment, retinal hemorrhage. Do not forget that when we perform cataract surgery due to congenital cataract, when we face those patients, there is no way to perform a cataract in small patients uh, without performing a vitrectomy. We need to work close with the pediatric department, with the neonatological department, in order to get the more quality of life in our patient from the side point of view. Speaking of working closely together, how did you, uh, Dr. Zur, and Dr. Iglicki get introduced to one another because your work is so incredibly close? Yes, so uh, we met in 2016 as part of the International Retinal Panel or International Retinal Group, which we founded later on. And since then, we're working very closely. We have uh, 
multiple uh, research projects that work on that we have published. For us, it's work, but it's mostly fun to work together. It's fantastic. We have a very nice and unique opportunity to meet some years ago and since that first day we have been working together we are enjoying the journey that is uh, working together and doing research as everyone knows uh, so doing research takes a lot of time so if you don't do not enjoy the journey the publication is one day or two days and you are very happy one two days but then you have been working for six, eight months, so you have to be very close. And we, we mental skills in action. So we combine our weakness and our strengths all together. And we have beautiful papers. And I'm not going to be flushed to say that we have achieved um, an, awesome, an awesome number, not only from the number of publications, but also for the quality of those. So we have published in these 12 months more than one or two papers per month, we would not have been possible without the help of Professor Lowenstein. She supervised every single manuscript, so we would like to thank in this opportunity Professor Lowenstein for her mentorship, not only to Dina and to myself, but also to every single young ophthalmologist, I think, around the world. Well, that's a great shout out. Um, and speaking of publications, what's coming up in your publication plans in the next month or two? Uh, if you could both speak to perhaps one paper separately, that would be great. So I will mention just one paper that we are going to present also at the upcoming Euretina, where we show imaging findings in patients with fundus ivy punctata, so talking about inherited retinal diseases. And we have a very uh, commonly used uh, imaging modalities in order to uh, diagnose this uh, quite rare entity in a very um, simple manner. Uh, of course, we need electrophysiology testing, but I think this, uh, these findings will help also not inherited retinal disease specialists to diagnose this condition in a more easy way. Yeah, uh, I would like to point out one beautiful paper that we have been doing together. This is a multi-center international study that involves several countries around the world. What we were wondering in some different agents, drugs that we use intravitrally behave the same if the patient had a vitrectomy done or if the patient had not a vitrectomy performed. So we were surprised that, for instance, anti-VCF, they tend to get a more frequent clearance. That is to say, in order to that agent to work in a vitrectomy eyes, we need to inject more frequently because the vitreo is the substrate and the vitreo is needed in order to work that agent, in this case, anti-VCF such as ranibizumab, bevacizumab, or fibular cell. And then we compare those with DEX implant because how the implant is produced, the vitreo was needed when we are treating this patient. We uh, were very astonished uh, when we did the statistical analysis and we saw that there was no differences between vitrectomized and non-vitrectomized patients in the not only uh, functional but also visual acuity response when we use DEX implant. In every single patient that uh, had a vitrectomy performed, we have to think twice after which agent are we going to do or to inject or to use. If we uh, pick uh, anti-VCF, we have to check this patient more frequently because we know that duration of that treatment is or shorter than before. But when we use the implant, we didn't see any statistical significant difference in duration of this drug. So the paper who mentioned Dina is under consideration now in one high impact factor journal. And this paper, which is called the Vitex, Vitex study, it's under consideration in another high impact factor journal in ophthalmology. So we are looking forward to having some positive results in the upcoming weeks. And this paper will be also presenting in the upcoming El Retina meeting 2021 virtual edition. Well, Dr. Zur, Dr. Iglicki, it's such a pleasure to hear fresh voices in our great ophthalmic field. So thank you so much for joining our program today. Matt, thank you very much for inviting us. On behalf of Dina Sur and myself, 
We are more than grateful, delighted and thrilled for this unique opportunity. We know for sure that this will be a very nice interaction and we will have a lot of input and feedback that will help general practitioners, general ophthalmologists and also retina specialists in order to achieve uh, what we do every single day in our uh, daily basic practice. Thank you for this kind invitation. Thank you.